Decisions and Science Conference today. So um, I will present now you, Michelle Milinkovic. She will give a talk about the Ivo-Divo and physics of skin appendages and uh, skin colors and vertebrates. And he's a full professor at the University of Geneva. And by training, he's an evolutionary geneticist. And he has been studying also in Yale and University of Brussels and uh, went then to Geneva. And in the spirit of this whole conference, in the sense of interdisciplinarity and breaking enigmas, he, in my opinion, very well like, shows how you can combine newly developed methods and different fields of scientific research um, to get to the bottom of complex uh, problems that perhaps people before just took for granted and didn't really think about it. Uh, for example, like how the formation of skin cracking patterns could be like in crocodiles, if it's the same thing as in snakes or not, is it genetically guided or not? And also about the color patterning in chameleons, for example, which has been like everybody thought that had been solved. And then if you look deeper and really check it out, you really see that there are things much deeper beyond there. And uh, in general, there is much more going on apart from this, so you can have a look. But now, um, I let him speak and let him present his research, and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I will. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, this is a fantastic place. You're really likely to have a student conference. It's such a nice venue. And um, I'm going to try to shortly describe to you a few results that uh, came out recently from my lab, but indeed, the Ivo Divo, but also physics, because I'm indeed a proponent of multidisciplinarity, uh, of skin appendages and skin color invertebrates. So, um, why skin appendages, for example? Well, there is a tremendous um, variety of skin appendages, right? Even if you take a single lineage, just like um, or single, a single taxonomy group, because it's not a single lineage, that like reptiles, you have very, very different um, um, scale types. You have the, you know, very flat overlapping scales of snakes, for example. You have these lizards with spiny scales here. You even have conical spines. These are tubercular scales, etc. Very, very different types of scales. But of course, when you are looking at Yet other lineages like mammals, you also find a tremendous variation of skin appendages. Take, for example, this hedgehog and this not hedgehog. <laughs> this, is, this is a tenrec. It looks very much like a hedgehog, but this is actually much more closely related to an elephant than to a, a hedgehog. Okay? So these two bees, these two groups, developed independently the ability to develop spines. So this is, of course, super interesting to try to understand how during evolution uh, the mechanisms, uh, molecular mechanisms, were invented twice to transform a hair follicle into a spine-producing organ. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why we study skin appendages, because they are super interesting in terms of the various phenotypes you can find. Now, here is one story uh, about um, scales which uh, you might find interesting. If you look at how scales are formed on the body of a crocodile or on a snake, um, you have these group of cells that, are, uh, that can be evidenced by early developmental genes such as sonic hedgehog or, or beta-catenin. You see uh, these group of cells are labeled in dark blue. So, the way this is uh, patterned, by the way, is a different story. This is by reaction diffusion-like mechanisms, where you have this spatial patterning of uh, these group of cells. But anyway, at the end of this spatial patterning, you have a group of cells that will collectively form a scale. Okay? So this is a developmental unit. These cells are specialized. All right? They are different from the other cells that will form the interscale skin. And uh, these scale uh, uh, cells will form uh, first a symmetrical elevation that in snakes, for example, will later f uh, asymmetrize and then become, you know, uh, these overlapping scales and flat scales on the body of a, of a snake, for example. Okay, well, um, this is also the case for feathers and for hair. You have each of these skin appendages which is developing from one of these developmental units. Okay. So, <clears throat> on the head of these animals is the same thing. If you take the head of a, of a snake, you have each of these scales, which, by the way, get names by morphologists, labials, nasals, internasals, etc. 
they uh, come about through the development of developmental units. All right? Now, <clears throat> when we investigated uh, crocodiles, I was really very surprised by the disorganization, in a way, of the scales on the head of crocodiles. Because if you take a snake, as I said before, each of these scales has a name. Why? Because the position, size, uh, and number of neighbors of each of these scales is predictable. Okay? It's actually used as a taxonomic character to differentiate species, for example. And indeed, if you take this snake, you make a 3D reconstruction, we'll come back to that later, and you find a sagittal plane and you make a mirror image of the right to the left, for example, you see that the border of the scales corresponds very well between the right and the left. Okay? They overlap very well. Now, if you do that with a crocodile, it's a complete mess. The left and the right are completely different. This is really surprising. And if you take two different crocodiles of the same species, I insist, you will all, and you make non-rigid alignment. This is complicated to do, but any way you can do that, such that you actually align the two uh, uh, heads, you will also see that the patterns are very different. Like, you know, a fingerprint identifying individuals. You can really identify individuals on the basis of the pattern you see on the head of these crocodiles. So, to make a very long story short, this will be my shorter uh, story. We can, of course, discuss the details later if you're interested. But we were really surprised by the fact that when you analyze, when you quantify these um, networks of edges and nodes that form the scales, it looks very much like a cracking pattern, right? Like in cracking mud, you know, when you dry mud, you're going to get cracks here. If you're interested into the physics of this, this is not very complicated. We can discuss that. And you have the same thing when you have, for example, the glaze on a porcelain that is cracking because uh, the uh, glaze is cooling. So basically, this is happening when you have two layers, one of them that is shrinking faster than the other one. And if the two layers are adhering, you will, you will uh, accumulate tension, and at some point, it will be cracking or curing. So the fact that this um, quant quantitative analysis of just the topology of the scales on the face of the crocodile suggests this is cracking was, of course, very perturbing and guiding us towards investigating this in more details, right? So, of course, the obvious thing to do is to investigate the embryos, right? So you look into the crocodiles, and I already showed you a few of these pictures of these embryos. On the body, everything is normal. Each scale forms on the basis of a developmental unit, but not on the head. Here, this is an embryo that has been labeled with a, with a probe for beta-catenin gene, and you do find little developmental units, but they do not correspond at all to the scales. They correspond to uh, sensory organs. Again, if you're interested, we can discuss that. That's another study that we performed. But let's focus on the scales. Actually, how the scales form? Well, first, the face of the animal is smooth. The skin is smooth. And then you see that grooves appear on the side of the face. And then it will cross. It will, it will really um, progress across the, the face. And then you will have these different grooves that will connect with each other. Then you have new grooves that will appear in different orientations, will connect with previous grooves, etc., etc. A, a mechanism that is extremely similar, I'm not saying this is the same thing, but this is very analogous to physical cracking of a um, physical material in a tension field. Okay? So what is important here, the physics is super cool and interesting and we can discuss that, but what is really amazing is the fact that at the end of the development of the little crocodile, when you speak about a scale, you don't speak about the developmental unit. You are speaking about a random piece of very keratinized skin that has a shape and has a size and has a number of neighbors that depends on how these different groups connected with each other. All right? So a scale on the head of a crocodile is not homologous to a scale on the body. These are two different things that develop through very different developmental mechanisms. All right? This also allows me to put forward the interest of looking at non-model species, because obviously there are tons of interesting mechanisms occurring out there. And 
I'm not fighting against model organisms, they're absolutely necessary, but sometimes it's nice to think out of the box and look at uh, non-model organisms. So if you're interested, you can go uh, into much more details, of course, um, uh, by looking at the original paper. And of course, um, I'm available all evening if you want to discuss this in more details. Okay, a second aspect of uh, the development of skin appendages is, um, was also a big surprise for us. It's, it's the question of homology or non-homology among hairs on one side and scales on the other side and feathers as a third type of skin appendages. So obviously when you look at a well-developed hair or a feather or a scale, they are morphologically extremely different, okay? So it is difficult to find the um, evidence for homology or non-homology among these characters. Now, um, the reason why people have been fighting for quite a long time about the homology or non-homology of skin appendages is the following. If you take hairs and feathers, they develop from a local thickening of the epidermis that you can see here that is called the anatomical placoat, okay? While the scales in snakes and lizards, as I showed before also for the crocodiles, for example, they develop, not on the face, huh? on the body, they develop as uh, elevations, okay, regular dermoepidermal elevations, and there is no placoat, right? So this placoat is very characteristic of early development of hair and feathers. And then later, of course, these hair and feathers will additionally uh, be associated to a dermal condensation and they will become follicular organs, okay? Now, why is that a problem? The problem is that, of course, mammals and birds do not form a monophyletic group, all right? It's because birds are, uh, of course, uh, evolved from one group of reptiles and mammals evolved from another group of reptiles. So many people were, of course, discussing about the possibility that was the obvious hypothesis to put forward that uh, the placoat has been invented twice independently during evolution, once, for, once by birds and once by mammals, which is amazing, right? And then, for example, there are quite a few people who were suggesting scenarios to explain this. For example, that hair maybe have, uh, has evolved as a sensory appendage in interscale regions. So in the ancestor of mammals where there would be possibly scales, this is not clear at all, by the way, right? But you would have interscale structures that would become hair later when scales would be lost, right? Other people suggested that hair evolved from glandular structures, but also uh, the point is that it would be interscale tissue, right? In that case, of course, hair and scales are not at all homologous, right? Because hairs are actually uh, originating from interscale uh, skin. Other people, uh, such as Mercer, Wagner, and Pram, for example, and others uh, have been skeptical about this kind of uh, hypothesis because there is quite some similarities in terms of signaling, molecular signaling, in the development of the different skin appendages. But of course, you can answer to that this is co-option, right? Hox genes are used in development of the main body axis, but also in development of, of uh, limbs, etc. So you could think of co-option of the same regulatory uh, machinery for different structures, right? Okay, so we got very lucky because we obtained a fantastic help from this guy, which is the naked lizard that I found at a, at a, a pet fair, all right? And that's of course really surprising. This is uh, supposed to be a mutant of a bearded dragon, which is an uh, Australian species, and of course I bought these animals, you know, thinking that's really interesting, especially that the people selling this really convincingly suggested that, that no, no, because these guys usually knows a little bit about genetics because they cross animals and they like to do that, saying, no, no, this, this looks like a recessive trait, etc. And, and he was showing some data that was convincing. Because, of course, you could imagine you just stumble across a very weird animal that got, you know, some developmental accident or something. Okay. So we got these animals in the lab and we confirm indeed that it's a recessive uh, allele. This is a normal 
Pogona viticeps, that's a normal uh, a bearded dragon with all its scales. This is an heterozygous animal. All the scales are there, but reduced in size. Maybe you can see it especially well with the spines on the side here that are smaller. And then you have the homozygous, which indeed is totally scaleless. All right? Okay, so this is just um, a zoom on the back of the head. You can see these big spines in a wild type animal, and you have nothing in this homozygous mutant. Okay, so Nicola Dipoy, uh, postdoc in my lab, got interested of to you know, look for the mutation responsible for this phenotype. And then, of course, we started to look at the development of scales in normal bearded dragons, all right? So, big surprise, um, we actually found placodes. We found the columnar cells Okay, with the thickening of the epidermis, these cells have reduced proliferation as indicated here by PCNA staining. And then we find that you have a localized expression of beta-catenin and a subcategory of these cells is expressing sonic hedgehog. All these are extremely characteristic of plaque holes. You find that also in the development of hair of feathers, right? So we were like, oh my gee, actually, they have placodes. Everybody thought they don't have placodes, but they do. So obviously the next step was to look into other lineages. We look into snakes, we look into crocodiles. Same thing, we find all the characteristic anatomical and um, molecular of placodes in all these reptiles. Now, of course, the next obvious question is, why on earth nobody has seen that before, right? That's always the first question we ask ourselves, right? And the reason is very simple. Uh, if you look at a mouse, when it's developing the placodes, it's doing so across, basically, across the whole body. So placodes appear everywhere. So if you look, anywhere you look, you will see placodes, right? If you miss them because you're a bit too late, no problem. There is a second wave of placo development. There are different types of hair, guard hairs, all hairs, etc. So it's difficult to miss them. You will see the placodes, right? But in reptiles, we show that it is very different. The placodes appear in very specific spots on the body at very specific developmental stages, and then you will have progression of the development of the placodes in specific directions. So in other words, if you look here at the right time, you will see placodes. But if you look a little bit too late, you don't see placodes, it's already on early uh, scale, right? You would have to look a little bit in this direction, otherwise you don't see them. So again, basically, you have to look at the right place and the right time, otherwise you don't see them. Now, of course, that we characterize this dynamic, it's much easier. Just read the paper and you will be able to see the placodes yourself, <laughs> okay, uh, in a snake or in a croc or in a lizard. Okay, then, um, Nicola was looking for this mutation, remember, because that was the initial ID. And um, we realized that actually these animals don't have scales, but they also have no glands. So these are the femoral glands in the wild type animal, and you have no glands in the scaleless animal. We also found some um, abnormal development of teeth and of claws. So all this, immediately, if you are interested into the development of skin appendages, suggests for very specific, the involvement of very specific um, uh, signaling pathway, which is the EDA pathway, because it's well known that when you mutate some of the genes of the pathway in mammals or in birds, you have defects in hair development or feather development, in nails development, in, in mammary glands development in mammals, etc., etc. So it was fitting very well with that. So we sequenced a few uh, of the genes in the pathway, and sure enough, we found the mutation in the EDA gene itself, vector displays in A, where we found a big transposon that has been inserted in the exon of the gene, and this generates a new splice donor site, and finally what you get is a deletion of uh, one of the most conserved regions of, um, of the TNF domain of the gene. Okay, so for sure this must have a huge effect on the function of the protein. And sure enough, when we look into this, what is the effect uh, of this mutation on signaling? Signaling is completely modified. For example, I was speaking about sonic hedgehog before, just give you one example. Sonic hedgehog is very well um, <clears throat> characterized by uh, localized expression in the placode uh, for the normal uh, lizard, and you have nothing in the uh, scaleless lizard, okay? And if I take beta-catenin, you have again localized expression, and it's actually expressed everywhere 
uh, in the skin in the scaleless animal. So obviously you have all the early development of the placoid that is messed up and you never develop a placoid so you never develop a scale, right? Okay, so again, if you're interested, this is published here. Um, and now we can say that the situation is actually much simpler. All these structures, all the skin appendages, feathers, hair, and uh, scales are indeed homologous structures. They have been inherited from a common ancestor, except the scales on the head of the crocodiles would happen completely differently. Okay? All right, so these were a few of the stories that are going on in my lab regarding uh, um, skin appendages. Now, an, um, one of the other topics uh, that is pretty important in the lab are the pigmentary and structural colors in squamates. The reason for that is that mammals are great, but they are kind, they are kind of boring in terms of colors, right? They have uh, various shades of brown, but that's about it, right? If you look at squamates, this is absolutely amazing. Take just snakes here, you have vivid, uh, vivid yellow, greens, reds, blues, you name it, okay? And this is the same thing in lizards. As I always say when I show this slide, this is not photoshopped, okay? These are real colors of real animals. You have fantastic colors and fantastic patterns, by the way, We'll uh, come back to that. So how are they making these colors? So as you know, light is an electromagnetic radiation, and the spectrum of light is going from gamma rays to long radio waves, obviously. And you have a tiny portion of the spectrum that corresponds to the visible, the visible spectrum for about, from about 400 to 700 nanometers from blue to red. Okay, And now we're going to ask ourselves, um, uh, question that looks simple, but that is not. Why is this lizard green? Right? I can already tell you that there is no green pigment in vertebrates. Okay? So, why is that green? All right. So, first of all, when we speak about color, we of course think about pigments. Right? And what is a pigment? It's a molecule which is going to absorb some of the wavelength in the range, wavelengths in the visible range. When you have a yellow pigment, for example, it's yellow because it's absorbing blue wavelengths, and then everything else is mixed and gives us the impression of yellow, okay? So the light acquires color through depletion of some wavelength from the white light. Okay, so I can already tell you that this animal indeed has some yellow pigment, and this yellow pigment is contained in some specialized cells that are called xanthophores here in the dermis. And we can easily remove this pigment by chemical uh, ways. So if you use ammonium hydroxide, for example, you can remove the yellow pigment and you transform the green skin into blue skin. Amazing, right? You get a blue lizard. Now, what is this blue? This blue is not a pigment. This blue is generated through a process that is strictly physical. It's a light interference, and this is therefore not a pigmentary color, but a structural color. To explain this to you very quickly, we can speak about soap bubbles. If you take soap without pigment in it, and you make bubbles, you will get uh, iridescent bubbles. Where is this color coming from? There is no pigment. It's coming from interference, light interference. So what is happening? Imagine that you have a light ray which is arriving here, and this is the soap in blue, all right? So you have a layer of soap. So you arrive on an interface, and of course, when light arrives on such an interface, it can, it can uh, be reflected or refracted. So let's consider that this ray is refracted. Then there is a second interface here. Let's say it's reflected and refracted, okay? So the ray one did this. Okay, now take a second one and imagine that this one is bouncing back immediately, all right? While some rays bounce back or are refracted, this is quantum mechanics, we're not gonna discuss this, okay? But basically you know these things. You can have two rays here that arrive outside of the air of the soap bubble but they follow different routes. 
one of them uh, traveled a longer uh, distance, x o y distance, in addition to the other one. Okay. Now, if this extra distance here, x o y, is equal to an integer times a wavelength, then by definition, these two rays will be in phase. All right. So you will have what is called constructive interference. The signal will be uh, increased, and the red will be very visible. And by definition, if this is true for red, it's not going to be true for blue, right? So because the wavelength is different, so these two rays following the same routes, etc., will interfere destructively. So the signal of blue will be reduced, or in this case, completely annihilated because the phase is it's exactly in antiphase. Okay. All right. So this is structural color. You can have a vivid color which is not due to a pigment, but due to this phenomenon. Okay? Now, for those who are already wondering, yeah, but why do I have red here and blue here, etc.? We can discuss that later if you're interested, but in one word, it's very simple. It's because this is not flat. There is curvature. And the whole thing here, the, dis the extra distance that is uh, traveled by one of the two rays depends on the angle of incidence. Okay? And of course, the angle of incidence of the light and also the angle of observation by the observer changes when you look at different places on the hairball. Okay? So it's not magic, it's perfectly easy to explain mathematically. Okay, so now, why am I saying these things to you? Well, because light interference is happening in these lizards, in the skin of these lizards. You have blue skin, and this blue, this blue-greenish uh, color, is due to very specialized cells here that are called iridophores. These are fantastic cells. If you look at them under the electron microscope, you will find that they are packed with minuscule nanocrystals of guanine. Right? Each of these crystals is about 120 nanometers. Right? Really, really, really small. And as you can see, in this iridophore, they are very well organized. They form layers. All right? So this is a schematic of the, of the, uh, of the organization of these uh, nanocrystals. You have layers here. All right? Now, what you're going to have is a succession of interfaces. You will have uh, cytoplasms to make things simple. We don't exactly know what is actually there, right? but it's, let's say cytoplasm. You have cytoplasms, guanin, cytoplasms, guanin, cytoplasms, guanin. So you're going to have exactly the same effect as in the soap bubble, it will be, but it will be way more efficient. So that when you have about 10 layers of these nanocrystals, you have a 100% reflectivity of some specific wavelength. Right? So these things are acting as a selective mirror. It's absolutely beautiful. You get white light arrives on the structure. It goes through it because it's transparent, except some specific wavelengths okay, that will be reflected with 100% efficiency. This is why these colors are so intense and so pure. Okay? All right, so now what are the wavelengths that are um, reflected? This is depending on different parameters, but one very important one is the distance among these different layers. Of course, the system is not perfect. There is some noise. The distance is a little bit variable. So it's not going to be one wavelength that will be reflected. It will be a set of wavelengths, OK? So when we use this uh, equation for these irreal force, we find that what is reflected is centered on blue, but you have quite a lot of green also that is reflected. That's why it's blue-green, OK? OK, so now, if that is true, if all this is true, if we can push on the skin, compress the cells, and compress this uh, lattice, this series of layers of uh, guanine nanocrystals, we should change the color, right? Because we're going to change the distance between these layers. So if, you are, if I push. What am I going to get, red shift or blue shift? Blue shift, of course. You should get shorter wavelengths. So let's do this. You push. Boom, blue. OK? And of course, this is reversible, because the cells will slowly swell back to the normal state. Uh, if I can find my pointer here, and it will come, come back to green. Okay, so this is very clearly demonstrated that indeed these are structural colors. Now, 
The reason why we were investigating these guys is because it's, uh, it's a, this species is part of a big genus called Felsuma, and there are many species that are exhibiting very different colors from very yellowish to very blue uh, with different kinds of greens as well, etc., etc. We were interested in this diversity. Now, we realize that if you really want to know why that specific species has that specific color, you have to look because it depends on the amount of yellow pigments you have and it depends on the exact geometrical characteristics of the lattice of nanocrystals. Okay? But then this explains that what I call this background color can be very blue, can be very green, can be yellowish, etc. Now, these animals also generally have red marks. Right? And this red is due to a pigment, a red pigment. There is another interesting story about that. Uh, this red pigment is made, I'm going to just tell you that, and then we can discuss for those interested. This red pigment is made by exactly the same molecules and the yellow pigment. Same thing. It's just the same thing. So now you think, oh, how is that possible? We can discuss it later. Okay, so anyway, this is a pigment, right? And, of course, given that, in, at least in this species, it's really bright red, I was absolutely convinced there would be no iridophores behind. Because if you have iridophores behind, you reflect green and blue, so you would expect to get something purplish, but not this beautiful red, right? And actually, it's full of iridophores, but these iridophores are very different. They are very disorganized. Right? So the, the individual nanocrystals have quite variable sizes, orientations, etc. The distance among the different crystals is very variable. So now what you have, it's not anymore a specific um, um, you know, a reflector that is going to reflect a specific wavelength. It's going to be a broadband reflector. It's reflecting a bit of everything. It's reflecting white light. Okay? And actually, this is exactly also what you have on the belly of these animals, which are beautiful ivory white. So I like this uh, concept because, you know, we often think about white as being, you know, nothing, the absence of something. And actually, it's white because of the presence of these iridophores. So please meet structural white. Okay? All right. So now we can understand why this lizard is green. Okay? This lizard is in green because it has a pigment layer, okay, yellow pigment, and then it has these photonic crystals. So the white light arrives, you have the yellow light and the red light goes through. It's not absorbed by the pigment, it's not reflected by the photonic crystals. Then you have the blue. The blue is absorbed by the yellow pigment, and depending how much yellow pigment there is, you will have some or all of it that is absorbed on the way in, and then it will again be absorbed on the way out because it's reflected by the photonic crystals. So the only thing you see is green because that's all what is left. Okay? And actually, if you take, indeed, a spectrometer, I always tell myself I have to add a slide showing this, but believe me, you take a spectrometer and you put the probe on the animal and you have green, nothing else. So this is not an impression of green, it's really green wavelengths. Okay? All this complicated stuff that has been uh, invented through evolution just for these animals to blend in an environment which is full of pigment, chlorophyll. Okay. okay, so of course there is a, an emblematic group of lizards that are called chameleons. Uh, why emblematic? Well, for many reasons, but one of them is that some of these species have the remarkable ability to change color. Right? And I hope you see this, you know, it's better on my screen, obviously. But this is a um, cryptic chameleon, so it's a green chameleon that is hanging out in the tree. Very difficult to spot, believe me. You know, uh, take a, it takes a while to really get used to find them. Um, anyway, so very well uh, um, um, camouflaged. And then, this is, a, this is a mature male. If you present another mature male to that guy, Definitely it's going to be angry because this is his territory. You don't come here. That's my tree. So they're going to become bright yellow or bright orange or bright red depending on the species, depending on the morph, the population, basically. But uh, what is happening is it's going from a very cryptic to a very visible state. Okay, It's a two-state system. right? 
So it's trying to show off how strong it is, etc., etc. And uh, of course, at some point, if the other male doesn't go away, they will physically fight. Okay, always the same story in all animals. So now um, they also do that to display towards female to attract potentially receptive females. So now people, um, you can find that in textbooks. When they uh, try to explain this, they say, well, it's very easy to understand. It's because of dispersion aggregation of pigments and of the story. Okay? The idea is certainly not stupid because that's what is happening for melanin. Uh, most reptiles, amphibians uh, are able to indeed change their brightness. Okay? They can become very dark or very light colored. Right? But that's not a change of color. It's, it's not a change of hue. It's a change of brightness. And why they can do that? Because indeed melanophores are these huge cells with fingery extensions, and the melanin is included into these melanosomes that can travel into these extensions. So, by the way, fish do the same. So this is a, a, a movie by, whoops, I'm losing something here. Uh, Richard uh, Wheeler um, using a fish here. And you can see indeed, that the animal can become darker or lighter, because this is reversible, uh, as a function of dispersion aggregation of melanin. Right? And people just extrapolated. And they thought, well, that's the same for red, green, uh, sorry, not green, but uh, red and yellow. So uh, that's what is happening in chameleons. But when you look into the skin, it doesn't make sense, because these uh, xanthophores containing the yellow pigments don't have this finger extension. They don't seem to change size. So we had to think differently. And then when we looked into the um, um, iridophores, because they are packed with iridophores, we were really surprised to see the amazing and beautiful organization of these nanocrystals. They are organized, when you make sections in different orientations, you can get these little squares, and then this is the representation of the lattice. If you rotate it, you get this. And then if you make a section, you get these hexagons. Okay? So by doing these different sections, you can actually identify the symmetry, okay? the crystal symmetry. And this is called FCC for those interested. Okay? All right. Then there is a second layer. So that was the first layer of iridophores that I called S iridophore for surface iridophores. And then you have deep iridophores here. Now, this is the same scale that are larger uh, uh, nanocrystals, and they're also more disorganized. And I don't think I will have time to discuss them in details. We'll focus on these guys here. Okay? The first thing we did was to film, take a video camera, and we're filming these animals where, while they were getting angry. You take a chameleon, show another male, boom, gets angry, gets yellow. Okay? And then you just record this. And then you take each frame of the video and you, you compute the average color of the animal on each of the frames, and then you plot this in a color space. You are used to the RGB color space for reasons that are technical and long to explain. We use the CIE color space. And each of these um, um, frames is a red dot on this graph here. So you see that the animal is losing a blue component and is gaining a yellow, orangish, uh, reddish Component. So that's the trajectory in color space that the animal is taking when it's changing color. Okay? Now, because we see this and because we know what we know about structural colors, we had this very tempting hypothesis, which is that, wait a minute, maybe these guys are able to actually change themselves the distance among their nanocrystals and change color that way. All right? Cool hypothesis, but you better test this, right? Properly. So the first thing we did was, of course, to perform numerical simulations. So you basically uh, compute the optical response of this lattice for different values of the distance among these nanocrystals. And then you plot the trajectory of color change if that was indeed the case. And what you get is the, the white line there. Okay? So you have a wonderful fit between the observation and the numerical simulations. So that becomes, it transformed from a wild, crazy hypothesis to a pretty good hypothesis. And we tested further, obviously. And first thing we did, we took a sample uh, on the animal when it's relaxed, okay? Then we take a second sample after it's excited because it's really angry seeing another male just next to the first sampling, of course, one millimeter next to it, and you can see that the distance has changed. 
But now to be more uh, quantitative, we take a piece of skin ex vivo, and I think this is the best demonstration of what's going on. We take a piece of skin ex vivo and we look under a uh, microscope and we look at a single iridophore, right? And then we change the osmolarity of the medium, so we make the cells change, um, and the cells swell and shrink at will, okay? And then what we see is that indeed the cell change color and when we take a video of that cell, we get the red dots here. So it's exactly the same uh, trajectory than on the whole animal. Okay? And this is the movie showing you um, the change of color. You can see that the cell itself is changing color from red to blue, going through all the colors of the rainbow. Okay? All right, now there is a second area, as I said, I don't have much time to discuss this. All what I can tell you is that this is an invention of chameleons, because we discussed this guy, for example, they have nanocrystals, but they have one type, okay? Can be different between different species, but they have one type. Chameleons, they have two layers that are very different, right? That one, the S-04, are clearly involved in color change, and the second one might be also involved in color change, or might be involved in something else. In the, in, the, in the paper, we indicate that the reasons why we think that these crystals actually allow the animal not to overheat, the reason being that um, the um, um, spatial organization of these nanocrystals uh, show that they are responsible for the very strong near-infrared reflectivity of the skin. So a lot of near-infrared is reflected, so much less energy is absorbed by the animal, so we think it's reducing the heat stress of the animal. So for this part, the conclusion is that chameleons can change color. It was thought that it was due to uh, dispersion aggregation of pigments. Uh, we show that actually they do this by active tuning of the lattice of gunning nanocrystals, which is pretty cool, I think. And then we show that there is a deeper population of iridophores that maybe provide passive thermal protection. We're investigating that further right now. But for sure, uh, these two superposed layers is an evolutionary novelty for chameleons. It does not exist in other lizards to our knowledge. Okay? If you are interested to hear about the whole story, there is Derek Muller. I don't know if some of you know him. Uh, he has this Veritasium channel, which is a physics channel, which is very nice. And he took all our results and compiled a nice video explaining all this in details. If you are interested, uh, just type Veritasium Chameleon and you will find it. Okay. All right. So all this is uh, a lot of, um, you know, physics of how this is working. Um, but I was also speaking about Evo Devo. Where is Evo and where is Devo there, right? So, <clears throat> of course, for the uh, story uh, on the structural colors, what we are doing now, without saying it, it's obvious, we are trying to understand how, during development, cells can generate nanocrystals. This is a known. And how they are able to organize them in space, in 3D space, to generate this lattice, right? So this is a line of research that is very active in my lab for the moment um, in collaboration with uh, Marcos gonzalez Guyton, who is a cell biologist in, also in Geneva University. Okay, but now I'm going to speak a little bit about patterns, color patterns. So I'm pretty interested into um, the different patterns that you can find on snakes, okay? Different species of snakes can have very, very different patterns. You have this one that has... Um, dorsal saddles, as you can see here, and this guy has longitudinal marks. This guy has a single dorsal line, okay? So what is funny is that all these are actually the same species. All these are mutants, pattern mutants of corn snakes, okay? But they recapitulate phenotypes that you do find indeed in nature in different species. So we're interested to understand how these phenotypes come about. So, of course, when we started that, People were just saying, I'm crazy, because this is not Drosophila, right? So uh, the uh, generation time is about three, four years, so it takes time. But after eight years, nine years, about nine years of um, uh, breeding uh, colonies of these snakes of different um, phenotypes, we now can indeed use a SNP segregation uh, after deep sequencing of families to try to identify the mutations 
the genes that are mutated and, and causing these phenotypes. Okay, um, now these patterns are generated because there is um, a set of interactions, long-range and short-range interactions between three types of cells. The xanthophores, the yellow cells, the iridophores, and the melanophores. This has been beautifully um, uh, demonstrated by a large set of uh, experiments and data in zebrafish performed by uh, the team of Christian Nelson Volhard at Max Planck in Tübingen. I actually met uh, one of uh, her uh, previous postdoc is somewhere here, I think, so you can speak to him in details about this if you're interested. And um, this can be very efficiently modeled by a Turing-like mechanism. You have heard, I guess, about Alan Turing, uh, which mathematically describe the fact that when you have short-range and long-range interactions among at least two components, one, one being an activator, the other one being an inhibitor, one of them diffusing faster than the other, all these can be described very uh, um, specifically. You can get patterns. You can get stripes. You can get spots. You can get labyrinths, etc. And these interactions can actually be modeled very efficiently, efficiently mathematically by this uh, framework. Okay. And then, for example, Kondo, Shigeru Kondo in Japan, has been playing with this uh, when you indeed ablate uh, melanocytes, for example. Uh, in zebrafish, you will see that the system, the reaction diffusion system, uh, will find a new steady state that can be recapitulated very efficiently by numerical simulations implementing these Turing mechanisms. For the purists, this is not absolutely, uh, this is not strictly speaking a Turing mechanism because there is no diffusion because actually these cells interact with each other's long range and short range by cell cell contacts. But this is, I would say, a detail. The principle, the concept is extremely similar. Okay, so now obviously, given that this, we are interested in two animals that are not zebrafish, we have to gather our own molecular data, obviously. So we are getting a lot of transcriptomics. We made a, a, a big database, which is called the reptilintranscriptomics.org database, if you're interested. All this is obviously publicly available. This is Zika et al. paper in Genome uh, Biology 2015. And of course, we are also uh, producing um, uh, the genome of the corn snake, the version one, which is a draft genome, has been published in 2014. And this is uh, work that is led by Athanasia Zika in my lab. This is her PhD student, Asier uh, Ulate. And the version two, which is nearly uh, chromosome quality, is coming very, very soon. Okay, so now that we have enough uh, genomic data and transcriptomic data, we can think of pr uh, perform, performing gene mapping and then identify the mutations that are responsible for these color phenotypes. So obviously, we are breeding all these animals in the lab. Okay? And I will give you two examples that has been performed by various people, but mostly by Sophie Montordon and Susan Senko, one PhD student and one postdoc in my lab. The first um, mutation that we looked at is the amelanistic mutation. So this guy is a wild type corn snake. You have dorsal saddles, lateral blotches, and then you have these beautiful checkers, checkboards of white and black on the, on the belly. Okay? Now, if you take um, a melanistic snake, you have exactly the same pattern, but the black, all traces of black are missing. You see that the black is replaced by white here for example. And then we uh, published uh, very recently in scientific reports the um, identification of the mutation. So basically what we did was, of course, to uh, deep sequence offsprings of the two phenotypes in a controlled uh, cross, and we perform exome assembly, and we could therefore identify all the SNPs that co-segregate co with the mutation, and we could therefore uh, identify an interval, in this case of five megabase pairs, uh, that contains a mutation. Of course, in this case, the interval is pretty big, and there are quite a few genes in there, but we got very lucky because one of the candidates is a beautiful candidate because it is very well known to be involved as a major determinant of human skin, hair, and eye color. Right? So we sequence it, and boom, yes, we find a huge mutation here. In an intron, there is a retroposon. By the way, um, especially snakes and lizards 
are full of retroposons. They have a much larger set of uh, um, repetitive sequence, actually, than mammals, for example. So we find a retroposon here that has been inserted in the intron that is generating three new exons that are spliced, and you generate two premature stop codons, and the protein is completely truncated. Okay? So now this actually resolves uh, a mystery because the reason why we started with this phenotype, yes, is because it was the oldest mutation, so it's sort of a proof of concept, but also because it doesn't make sense when people were saying, this animal doesn't have melanocytes. If you remove melanophores, you mess up completely with the Turing mechanism, okay? And that has been shown, for example, in zebrafish, you don't get normal um, patterns. So here now we understand what's going on because that gene actually is involved in controlling the pH of the melanosomes and also transporting tyrosine, which is the uh, molecule required for producing melanin. So the melanophores are there. They are perfectly normal. They just cannot make melanin. Okay? Here we go. And then the second mutation, this is not yet published, is a pattern mutation. This is a really nice locus because we have three alleles, the wild type, the motley, and the striped one. So the homozygous striped has very, very modified pattern. As you can see, instead of having the dorsal saddles, it has just two lines that are longitudinal. It lost all the lateral blotches, and it has no checkers. And then you have the motley allele that is a little bit more subtle because you have the saddles that are extended, as you can see, and they join in the neck region. They join with each other, and you also have the lack of checkers. We found both mutations. One of them is regulatory, and the other one is structural. Okay? And again, this is demonstrating that even with non-model organisms, you can investigate complex uh, phenomena such as uh, uh, pattern, color pattern formation. So these guys are exactly the same species. You have a tremendous variation generated by a mutation, single locus mutations affecting patterns. Okay, I will quickly finish by showing you my favorite toy, which is uh, Ruby 3D that we, it took us two years to develop. Um, and this is a fantastic tool. So this is a robot, and I will stop it somewhere. Here. Oops, missed it. Yes, no, not when there is a flash. Here we go. So... You have here, the, the yellow part is just an industrial robot, you know, that you use to make cars, right? So we bought that robot, and then everything else we developed. So what is everything else? You have a super high-resolution camera here, about 45 million pixels. You have a fan of super powerful LEDs, right? And then you have all the electronics, and more importantly, you have also all the computer science behind it. So what is happening is that you anesthetize your lizards, or you take your museum specimen. This is a museum specimen. It's very anesthetized. It's dead. Okay? And you just take pictures around the animal. And the method to reconstruct in 3D is complicated, but in very short, um, very short terms. What you do is that you compare the images do two by two, and then you try to identify the automatic methods to do that, of course. Identify the same points, and then you can tri once you have done that, you can triangulate the position in 3D of that point. Okay, So this is very, very heavy in terms of computation, but this is working pretty well. And you get a resolution, which is not bad at all. Um, you get a resolution of about, let's say, half a millimeter. Not bad. So you scan your animal. That can be with this robot up to 1.5 meters, and you have a resolution to 0.5 millimeter. Nice. Now, some of these lizards have tiny, tiny, tiny scales, and we're interested in two we want to understand how um, the uh, shape of these scales is generated, etc. So we want to have not only the position of each scale, but also the shape of each scale. So obviously this is not enough. So we use a second technique, which is much easier to explain, by the way. And this is what you will see here. You can go around the animal, but what you can also do is that you can stop at a position here. You can stop, and then you can take one picture for each lead, all right? So you take always the same picture, basically, but your 40 million pixels are here, right? 45 million pixels. And then the intensity of each pixel, pixel will change as a function of the orientation of the light and the orientation of the pixel, so the geometry of the object. 
and you can extract the geometry of the object with a resolution of 15 microns. Okay? So with this, we get animals that are scanned down to 15 micron resolution, and uh, that's pretty efficient. Now, what we could also do is something I have been dreaming of for many, many years. We anesthetize the poor snake, and we put it above the first axis of the robot, and then the robot can turn around it and scan it. Because when you think about it, a snake is a simple shape. It is very difficult to scan entirely. Okay? By doing this, as you will see, the robot is capturing the whole snake very uh, efficiently. Okay? Here we go. So this way we have now objects that we can analyze mathematically. Right? We can uh, uh, measure anything we want uh, on these animals. So just to show you the resolution, this is a SEM image, scanning electron microscopy image, of the eye of a fly that the poo beast was actually going around the lab at the time. So we killed it, put it under the um, scanning electron microscope, and you see the omatidia, right? OK, so now we take the same fly and we put it under Robbie, and you see the omatidias. OK? Right? There is no magnifying lens. Right? It's just by using these uh, fancy uh, computer science tricks that we can generate them. Here we go. So, if you're interested in Ruby, uh, know this, uh, or you type Ruby 3D, or you go on my website or whatever, and you will find them. Uh, you can see movies uh, showing you this. But I can show you uh, a few examples. So, this is one of these Felsuma lizards. All right. So, you can have your model, and you can zoom, and you can do whatever you want. And then you can have uh, your snake, for example. Here we go that is fully labeled, and now you can be quantitative, because that's the problem. Before that, we are just qualitative. If you want to be quantitative about these patterns, you need that. And finally, we, of course, want to do numerical simulations on 3D surfaces, because Many people do these numerical simulations on 2D surfaces, but actually the steady state that will be generated by the reaction diffusion system is influenced by the geometry, because of course the skin is not flat, the skin is living in a 3D world, right? If you can see that here, this is a recent paper that we published, where you have um, a cap here that is symmetrical, and this is asymmetrical, you see that the pattern is changing dramatically just because of the geometry, okay? So, um, multidisciplinarity is, of course, essential in my lab, and I think this is uh, uh, really important. So, uh, Tanasia and, and I have a really fantastic team of people. Um, two postdocs, Alexandra is a, is a physicist, uh, Gabriel is a, a developmental biologist, and a set of PhD students from computer scientists, physicists, um, uh, bioinformatician, computer scientist, mathematician, uh, developmental biologist, uh, Athanasia is evolutionary biologist. And of course, uh, you also need super good technicians uh, for the lab, but also for the animals, because uh, this is uh, very important in lab. We have more than 2,000 animals, and you have to take care of them very, very well. Here we go. So <clears throat> I think that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity is key and will be more and more important in the future. So if I have one single message to convey, it's that one. Much more than everything else I told you up to now. Multidisciplinarity is key. And I think that decategorizations into biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics is mostly an artificial categorization. It doesn't make much sense. And unfortunately, this is uh, the categorizations on which the curriculum is based. Yes, you have mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, and then you end up, if you do, for example, biology, you end up doing something very specific in biology and never, you never hear anymore about physics, chemistry, and mathematics, and that's a huge mistake. One of the reasons why it's a mistake, it's because if you look at what we do in my lab, for example, we do a lot of, of biology, physics, and computer science, and if you just take um, physics and biology, so biology is in green here and physics is in blue, part of biology is much closer, conceptually speaking, in terms of the concepts used, much closer to, for example, soft matter physics 
than to other aspects of biology. Okay? So being categorized as a biologist doesn't tell you much. It depends what you do. Okay? So I think this is very important. And yes, we have to make necessary choices because you cannot learn everything, right? But still, I think that there are way too few bridges among disciplines in all the curricula, uh, especially in Europe. And because of that, the students have a very little realization of the overlap. They are really surprised when they realize that physics is crucial for what they are doing, or mathematics or, or chemistry is crucial for what they are doing when they are biologists. So what I want to do, what I want to promote is a new generation of chameleon scientists, okay? <laughs> of uh, scientists who have some ideas of the major concepts that are relevant for what they investigate in one um, uh, category of science, but uh, that comes from other category of sciences. Okay, so I will stop here. Many people to thank. I think I did along the way. Um, uh, fantastic collaborators such as um, Marcos Gonzalez Guyton in cell biology, where I told you we are investigating the development of nanocrystals, and then also for the uh, linkage mapping in Uppsala University, Leif Anderson, who is really a fantastic collaborator. And I thank you for your attention, some sponsors, and uh, I can take any question. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great talk. I'm sure that there are questions.